Welcome back, folks. Uh, it's a nice morning, late morning uh, in northwest Louisiana. Uh, temperatures are cool for our time of the year. This will be lecture 3B, so the advanced uh, part of the third week lecture. If you go to slide uh, 2, you can see uh, we're, we are reminded of our extended enterprise environment, or the triple E. And if you go to the next slide, that's my usual picture for the five forces model, which is uh, a, 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 rendi a, a rendition, <laughs> if I can find the right word, for um, the industry structure. And the reason why I like the triple E on the prior slide is it combines, you remember from chapter three of the textbook, it combines the general environment with the industry en environment at one in one chart. And so remember, this is where the classic SWOT strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and the pestle plus global issues uh, analysis comes from. So what we need to know um, in, in this lecture is that every industry has a value chain. And remember we use that, that, that term or that phrase to talk about the company's value chain. Well, every industry also has a value chain. And if you'll notice from this example of the Cuban cigar industry, from the upper left, we have the farmers in Cuba that grow some of the finest tobaccos. I don't know if any, any of you all enjoy a fine premium cigar. I certainly do. Uh, there's the uh, Cuban government, dealers, wholesalers, retailers, and, and, and consumers. That is the flow by which value is added to the product or service at the industry level not the company level. And going back to the five forces model, you'll notice the on slide three, the middle figure, which is called rivalry among existing firms. That's really the unit of analysis in the five forces. And so going back to slide four, who are the existing players depends on where you're analyzing in the industry value chain. So for instance, if you're looking at the dealers, the suppliers are the Cuban government, and particularly uh, an entity called Habanos SA. And your buyers or your customers are the wholesalers. On the other hand, if we're analyzing the wholesaler part of the industry value chain, you can see the suppliers are the dealers, and the buyers are the retailers, and so forth. So every industry has a value chain. If you go to the next slide, you can see the global hotel industry value chain, a lot of players there. Very, very complex industry structure. And this is why, in addition to the general environment where we have those pestle factors, it's really so important to understand the industry. If you go to slide six, uh, you can see the complex interrelationships uh, in and among that industry. And you'll notice to the to the next, uh, next to the far right side, where it talks about the buyers, business buyers of rooms or end consumer buyers of rooms, notice Expedia and Priceline. Those are entities w that we call complements in an industry that really, through the force of the internet, inserted themselves into the industry structure. Very, very important then to analyze who the various players are in the industry value chain. So what we want to add to the basic chapter in the textbook is these five forces set a ceiling for average industry return on invested capital. Remember last lecture, we said, you know, for instance, if there's 10 firms in an industry, existing players, we rank order high to low each of their return on invested capital, and we create an average of the 10. That is average industry return on invested capital. Now, by the way, again, don't worry about financially, because I know some of you have only had the two leveling courses, BADM 700 or 701. Basically, return on invested capital is, operate, is net operating profit divided by invested capital, which is the summation of working capital plus fixed capital, as we've discussed. Five very unfavorable f forces will drive that industry average return on invested capital 
to risk-free savings rates of returns. Very, very low, 3 to 5%. Uh, you remember in the last lecture I mentioned that pharmaceuticals as an industry has a very high average return on invested capital, near 40%. And steel and, air, steel and airlines have a very low ROIC, around 5%. We know in those industries that have very low average ROIC that the balance of the power in the five forces is very unfavorable. Conversely, in the pharmaceutical industry with, with such high average industry ROIC, the balance of the five forces is very favorable. It has to be to allow the existing firms, you know, those that are in the middle block of the five forces, to enjoy average industry profitability. So if you go to slide eight, and as I mentioned, we do know that within any industry, let's go back to an industry that has 10 players, even though the average might be high, you know, there's a distribution around an average, right, a variance. So some are going to be higher than the average, some are going to be lower than the average. But the point is, you'd rather be in an industry where the average starts off very high, and you, some are even higher than the average and some or lower. So if we go to pharmaceuticals with an average of 40% return on invested capital, some are even higher than that. Some are lower, but we get to an average. So why is industry analysis crucial? Point four on slide eight. The business unit method of seeking competitive advantage that we'll talk about next week. The low cost provider, the differentiator, and we, we also gave you an overview in week uh, 1B part two, is that that method of seeking competitive advantage must align with the five forces. If it's out of sync, you're looking for huge problems. The firm will probably not be on the PPF and face huge danger. So the bad, uh, slide nine, the bad and the ugly due to the five forces. Powerful customers or buyers can force existing firms. So remember, existing firms are that group in the middle. Remember from last week's lecture, let's say the auto manufacturers. Those would be existing firms. So powerful customer or buyers, either dealers or end users, can force those existing firms to lower their prices and or take, take on, in other words, those existing firms, take on the cost of more service for those uh, very powerful groups. The dealerships in the auto industry have moderate power over the manufacturers. The manufacturers can basically force the dealers to do a lot of things. But if the dealers had power over the manufacturers, the manufacturers would have to do uh, bear a lot of expense to service those dealers. Conversely, powerful suppliers can force existing firms to pay more for their inputs and or take on the more cost of doing service. So for instance, if we have a very powerful supplier group, they may force on the existing firms, the existing firms to take ownership of all the inventory and get, get all of that completely off of the supplier's books. The threat and reality of new entrants, oh, that causes all problems. If, if we have what's called low barriers to entry into the existing uh, group of competitors, uh, the threat and reality of those new entrances causes price declines in the existing firms, more investment of all kind, um, including marketing and advertising, to try to prevent that entry. Think about Tesla entering the automotive manufacturing industry. The threat and reality of substitutes, you remember a substitute for an automobile might be a bicycle, motorcycle, mass transit, sets a new lower ceiling for price increases and can force increases in marketing and advertising to remind customers of the current value. Uh, if we, we do have a credible threat. If, if the price of automobiles gets way, way high, the cost of fuel gets high, motorcycles are a huge potential substitute. And finally, those existing firms themselves, if they are very rivalrous, if they are getting into price wars against each other, um, think about Walmart and some of its competitors, Target, um, and some of the other volume discounters are always having price wars against each other. Uh, this causes, of course, price, uh, price declines, and we have to spend more in advertising and marketing just to keep our name out there.
So what can an individual firm then do with respect to the industry five forces? Well, we can try to position on the PPF. Hopefully, we're on the PPF. If we're not on the PPF, remember, we need to find a position there. They can defend against the five forces, but take them as a given and just simply attempt to not make them worse. Or the firm can decide to move forward down the industry value chain or backward in the industry value chain if those places offer more opportunity for profitability. The last example, which is very rare, or the last thing we can try to do with respect to the five forces, which is very rare, is to, is to try to change the balance of the five forces to the industry, uh, to the company's uh, favor. And this almost always involves shifting the PPF out, remember, lowering, lowering costs further while increasing customer willingness to pay. Uh, and again, think of Apple as one that has probably enjoyed that very rare opportunity to do that. Most firms operate at the first bullet point. They simply take the five forces as a given, and they try to not make them worse with respect to impacting average industry return on invested capital. One point I want to make then is that the, the five force industry structure changes much more, much less frequently than the general environment. So the general environment of global issues, the overall health of the economy, uh, interest rates, gross domestic product, those things change much more frequently than the industry structure. But still, the industry structure is a very, very component of analyzing the strategy framework. And we're going to want to do that uh, in the integrative case Legos this time. Other data that we need to know about industries and markets. We need to know the current size of revenue of the industry and revenue and assets. For instance, you all know that Walmart on its own is about $565 million, I'm sorry, $565 billion in revenue a year. The size of the retail industry is into the trillions. So that's a very, very large industry. Some industries like cut flowers are very are relatively smaller. So we need but we need to know the size of what we're what we're dealing with. We know that we need to know, know the historic trend line and projected growth rates in the industry revenue pie. So is the pie expected to get larger, smaller, or stay the same going in the future? We need to also know average industry gross and net margins. Again, for those of you who haven't had accounting 701 and finance 701, don't worry about that yet. We need to know the historic and projected average industry return on invested capital. Uh, and then the, the second to last bullet point, we need to know the degree to which the industry is controlled by one or two key players. When I had a great strategy project in the pet food industry years ago, uh, I was working for uh, Alpo Pet Foods, and they were uh, the number six market share out of only six uh, manufa manufacturers of pet food in the United States. That industry was dominated by the Mars Brothers, you know, that makes Mars candy bars. Well, they also had a pet food division. And uh, that 500-pound gorilla is a, a, a very interesting aspect to have in an industry structure. If you go to retail cut flowers, you remember Flower Country USA, there's 17,000. That's very fragmented. There's no way one or two players uh, are going to control that industry. And then lastly, is the industry characterized by a supply and demand imbalance? If the existing players have more demand from buyers than they can supply, that's an ideal situation. If the existing players are at overcapacity and they have more supply than, it's, than is demanded, that's very bad because that will force down uh, prices. Um, quick example, I had in the... Uh, early 2000s, I worked with the top 44 executives at Burlington Northern uh, Santa Fe Railroad. And we were doing some strategy work, and, and it, the supply-demand balance didn't look good. There was too much rail capacity uh, for the amount of demand for rail shipments. Literally in 18 months, what later was called the China effect, we started getting a lot of imports from China, 
and rail demand picked up and it flipped it. There was more demand than supply and that allowed them to increase their prices because of the greater demand. So uh, let's define a, a key success factor then as we're analyzing industries. A key success factor is at the intersection, fancy word confluence, is at the intersection of what customers want. So who are the customers and what, what do they want? And how does the firm survive competition? So what drives competition? What are the main dimensions of competition? How intense is the competition? We get to that by understanding how rivalrous the existing players are and how can we possibly obtain a superior competitive com position. When those two come together, that is a critical success factor. In other words, we must be very good at that. I worked with a firm three years ago where many of the existing players in the industry were unbranded. Um, their logos, their names, their, their, the power of their brand was not that important. Um, the buyers uh, uh, haggled on price, they haggled on features, but what we determined through our analysis is that brand and developing a brand would become a critical success factor in that industry. So we knew we, we were eventually going to have a key strategic initiative around branding. So also uh, fascinating in when we look at industries is how do we predict the competitive behavior of our rivals on slide 13? We need to know what their strategy and strategy framework is, what their objectives are, what their assumptions or mental models are. You remember the example from Encyc Encyclopedia Britannica. And what are their resources and capabilities? We'll talk more about that uh, in, a, in a few weeks. That allows us to predict within a certain margin what strategy changes the competitor will likely do, and then really most important, how, they, how will they respond to our strategic initiatives or competitive initiatives? So in this particular firm, how will the other competitors respond when we um, come on strong with a new brand? I think I'm going to end here, uh, and we're going to divide this into parts one and part two, because the next part is a little bit intense and I want to make sure we spend some time with that. Okay. Okay. So welcome back. All right, Amber. This uh, will be lecture 3B part 2. And if you go to slide 14, uh, again, remember we're, we're talking about how to, how to analyze industries and markets. We're not talking about an indi individual firm, firm by firm. We're taking a look at that, that entity that groups of firms compete within couple absolutely key definitions that we understand. These tr phrases are used fairly loosely and as the strategist we need to understand them very very clearly. So let me try. Uh, economies of scale. This, as you'll see this really should be economies from scale. And remember scale is a fancy word for size. High, huge scale, big size. Uh, so it's usually referred to as uh, 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 unit cost decline as the number of units produced uh, happens of a single product or service. That's a no-brainer. That's just simply math. If you put costs in the numerator and units in the denominator, as you add units in the denominator, automatically cost per unit is going to fall. Really, economies from scale are those economies or savings that we get because we are big and we can uh, order, let's say, our supply uh, inputs in large order quantities and get a price discount. Okay? It's also a little more complicated than that. Uh, economies from scale, as we grow larger, we typically learn. So as we grow from year to year to year, uh, we grow from making two airplanes to eight airplanes to 32 airplanes to 64 airplanes where this concept of economies from scale happen. It was called the learning effect. And as we make more of them, we're able to get more efficient, smarter. We're able to take waste out and costs fall. If we stay very small and make 
two or I'm being facetious in an example. If we make five units of a product a year versus 5,000 products a year, the a chance for the learning effect to become more efficient to drive down costs will happen at 5,000 relative to five. Economies of scope is a phrase that you may not have heard and that basically you can read it for yourself, but basically it says how related are the products and services or when we see in corporate level strategy, the businesses, so that one dollar of marketing can be spread across multiple units. The higher uh, uh, economies of scope means we have related products and services and businesses that where we can leverage our marketing dollars. Let me give an example. General Electric, I think, I think I've used them before. They're in into CAT scanners, railroad locomotives, jet, in, uh, jet aircraft engines, broadcasting, financial services, what have you. So even though you'll see on the weekends sometime General Electric advertisements, the economies of scope from GE are actually relatively small. Let's go to Marriott Hotels. You think of, I can't remember all the various kinds of things they have in Marriott, but they, you know, they have Marriott, the Marriott brand. Um, they have, I think Homewood Suites is Marriott, but if you look at Homewood Suites, it'll say in, in small print, a Marriott company. That is the opportunity for very high economies of scope. The minimum efficient scale to compete in an industry basically says there is a minimum size or minimum scale where the cost per unit sold becomes acceptable. Anything below that and our, our cost per unit sold will be higher. Anything above the minimum efficient scale, our cost per unit sold will be lower. And a quick way to estimate the minimum efficient scale is simply rank, let's go back to the example of 10 competitors. Rank those 10 competitors from high to low in terms of sales or assets, high to low, and draw a line at the median point. Right there is an estimate of the size or scale you need to be to have minimum efficient scale. Okay, this next one is a lot on one slide, I realize, but it's a really important concept. And it, it basically has to do with what kind of market share should we be measuring and try to improve? And there's just some stuff there you can read, but the under, underlying realities of the possibility of economies from scale and economies from scope gives us the appropriate frame of reference to measure market share. So the question there in bold is, is it better to have 5% share in 30 markets or 30% market share in five markets? And remember how market share, if you haven't, this is the first time you're hearing this, Market share is simply your revenue, your company's revenue in the numerator, divided by the sum of the revenue of all existing players in the industry. That is your market share. So the answer to the question, is it better to have 5% share in 30 markets or 30% share in five markets? The answer is it depends, but in general, it's better to have 30% market share in five markets because of the economies from scale and, and economies from, from scope uh, allows us to not only get our cost per unit sold in a good position, but if we have 30% market share in five markets, that means customers know us, they know our brand, they know our existence, and their willingness to pay will probably be higher. If we are spread over 30 markets, and, and have a relatively small percentage, we dilute the possibility of lowering our costs and dilute the possibility of customers having a higher willingness to pay price point. So you can see there are four kinds of market share that are important to distinguish among. So when someone says, what's your market share? As a strategist, you should be saying, okay, what are we measuring? So local market share would be like Flower Country USA. What's important would be the market share 
of Flower Country USA metro area by metro area. So we would want to know what the market share, again, which is Flower Country USA's revenues in the numerator, divided by the sum of all retail sales in Dallas. Okay, what that market share is. And then through time, the venture was going to grow through other cities, and we'd measure that market share city by city. Okay? Quick example, I got into almost a fight with the head of marketing because he wanted to spend a million dollars on a Super Bowl ad before we'd even got out of Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now think about that for a minute. He wanted to have actually global exposure for uh, a business whose appropriate market share was local market share one at a time. Also, it was stupid. If we had that global advertising, we couldn't even fill an order in Seattle. So every which way you looked at that, it was, it was very stupid. Okay, so let's go to regional market share. When is regional market share, when does that become the market share we wanna, that we want to uh, measure and track and improve? Think of the Southwest region, the Southeast region of the United States. When would that market share be important? And you notice what we're doing. All we're doing is changing the denominator. Basically changing the denominator. So here, what goes on in the denominator of a regional market share is all of the companies that compete in that particular region add up all their sales and that goes into the denominator. Then we take our company's sales throughout that region as the numerator and that becomes regional market share. So it's any industry where transportation costs are a large part of the cost. For instance, cement is very heavy. Roofing products are very heavy. Food is perishable. So think of this for a minute. We wouldn't have a steel, uh, excuse me, a cement plant in Shreveport, Louisiana, which is part of the Southeast region and put it in trucks and ship it all the way to New York City. It doesn't make sense. The tra transportation costs are just too high. So the, again, if regional market share, even if we happen to be only competing now in the southeast region, our growth may have us move to the southwest region or the northwest region, but we would still measure regional market share by regional market share to get a baseline measure and from which to seek improvement. National market share. Okay, so now when is the United States sales in the denominator the proper denominator? That's when costs are low relative to value on a per unit basis and where basically the reach, reach and richness of the internet, we're going to discuss that in a few slides, uh, becomes a key leverage factor. So for instance, any of the products you enjoy buying through Amazon or a online retailer, for instance, for me, it's premium cigars. Think about that for a minute. The value of a box of, of premium cigars is way greater than the cost of transportation because it's very light. All of a sudden, if a, if a retailer, cigar retailer, is not really be, being prepared to measure its market share on a national basis, it's really, really going to be in a precarious position. So I look at all of our local, um, we only have two or three local retail cigar stores. They're not on the internet. They're not shipping. Uh, it's only a matter of time before they'll go out of business. So I want you to think about this. This is a, a, a not an easy topic to understand at first until you really think about it. Finally, when is global market share? Uh, important. That's again where the reach and richness of information allows the formation of a true global brand. Think about a Coca-Cola. A Coca-Cola is a Coca-Cola anywhere in the world. Coca-Cola and Pepsi have global brands. The denominator for Coke and Pepsi, which by the way are at about 35 percent global market share apiece, the, the, the denominator is worldwide global sales of carbonated soft drinks. Okay? So think about these four measures. I, I norm face to face I do a little board work 
and uh, if it's confusing, I'll do a little bit of work on my whiteboard, and we'll do a derivative, uh, a derivative video. Uh, on slide 16, then, lastly, other, thing, other things we need to, are, are, such thing, are, are things called strategic cost drivers, and we'll talk about those in a few weeks when we talk about the low-cost provider. But these are basically things that make the cost of an activity, you remember the activities in, our, in the company value chain, go up or down. And, um, and they directly affect the total delivery cost per unit sold on the PPF. So the question is, why, on slide 16, why would a Coca-Cola bottler prefer to have a plant and delivery capability in Oklahoma City rather than New York City? The answer is the strategic cost drivers in Oklahoma City allow for a lot lower cost per unit than uh, t coming from the Coca-Cola plant and delivering in New York City. Think of all the traffic jams, think of the, the inability to park, all those kinds of things are much better than in, than in Oklahoma City. Okay, let's take a look at what is going on with the internet in, in, in respect to industry value chains. Basically, the internet has caused industry value chains to collapse. In other words, you remember in the cigar industry where we had kind of a long chain? Well, the World Wide Web, the internet, has allowed middle, middlemen, as they're called, to be taken out. And I hate to have anybody go out of business to think about it, but it's really allowed the shortening of industry value chains and people a being able to go directly to the end consumer without some middle market channels. So this is really interesting. Before the World Wide Web, there was a trade-off between reach of information and the richness of information. So look at this ISO curve. Again, it's reversed from the PPF. Notice if you draw a point, it used to be if we had high reach of information, in other words, a, a super ad, a super bowl, uh, advertisement, 30 seconds, broadcast to millions of people all over the world. That was high reach, but think about it. It was very low in richness. So look at where the two, draw the curves, and look at where the two points intersect. There's not much we really can convey in 30 seconds. On the other hand, if we had very high richness of information, let's say our product requires a very technical sales force to go out one-to-one -one making a new sale and then servicing existing sales before uh, if we had very high richness of information the reach wasn't very far. We'll go to the next slide on 18. The World Wide Web flipped that relationship. We can now have both high richness and reach of information and it, it's, it, it, in 1993, yes 1993, uh, the internet was not understood but we understand it now and uh, it has fundamentally changed that, that uh, aspect of competition. So slide 19 is one of my favorite authors, Adrian Slywatsky, kind of summing up here, uh, lecture 3B, part two. As you notice on the left is the profit protecting power index, what he called the strategic control point index. As we're analyzing the five forces, as we're analyzing the general environment through a pestle, uh, as we're, we're, in other words, and, and understanding whether the five forces are favorable, this gives us uh, a ranking of how easy or hard it's going to be to maintain high industry and company return on invested capital. So notice, if you own the standard, dating myself a little bit, when beta and VHS were battling for the standard and VHS won, um, I think it was Sony that won that out, uh, that gave them very, very high profit protecting power or a very key strategic control point. Kind of read down from top to bottom. If we lead the industry value chain, uh, that, that is really good. Coca-Cola uh, and Pepsi and Intel in the example uh, control a lot of the aspects of that industry value chain. You can kind of read down uh, the way, when we get down to three, which is not good profit protecting power, we are a commodity, not much room for differentiation, with a 10 to 20 percent cost advantage, that would be new core steel and Southwest Airlines. And then one is a commodity that should be a commodity with cost disadvantage. We're not differentiated and our costs are higher. There's countless of those and they're about ready to go out of business.
So the next two slides give us away uh, just a picture of uh, the soft drink industry and the global wine industry case studies that we've done before is simply a way that we could sum all of this up and, and grade the overall favorableness or attractiveness of the industry structure. We'll be doing this for the integrative case uh, Legos as well as one of the skill applications. By the way, there's an addendum uh, that's optional and uh, if you just turn to slide 23, I'll show you how it works. Uh, these are the things that come from Dr. Michael Porter in my experience in using the five forces where the industry can try to mute an unfavorable force and these are some tactics uh, that allow to do this. There's a form of this in chapter three. It's a little more basic than that what's there. If you want a little bit more detail, uh, it's there for you as an optional basis. Okay, thank you very much and, and look forward uh, to chapter four coming up.